I'm sitting here with Barry Brody, and we are going to talk about his new ecolog, uh, A Great Round Wonder, which he wrote, uh, directed, is producing, and is acting in. So he's all over this, this new theatrical piece. It's a very, very interesting and unique piece of work, and I think uh, I'll benefit from a conversation with Barry about this, and hopefully you will as well. What is A Great Round Wonder about, and what makes it interesting? Uh, Great Round Wonder is about the environment and our uh, approach to it. Um, it. The reason I call it uh, an ecolage is because it is made up of the primarily the works of four philosophers of the past um, 150 years. And um, that is uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, John Muir, Kenneth Mills, and uh, David Suzuki. Um, I <clears throat> started out as a um, uh, project from the Kenneth Mills Foundation uh, to dr dramatize some material that had been uh, worked up uh, as a result of a panel discussion with Kenneth Mills and three um, environmentalists. Mm -hmm. One of those environmentalists approached me and said, uh, Barry, could you, could you dramatize this? Now, of course, I had some, some experience uh, dramatizing the work of Kenneth Mills and had been doing that for about 25 years. Um, prior to his passing in 2004. So I said, sure, I'll try my hand at that. So in doing that, I wanted to show more of a spectrum um, and actually tap into the uh, philosophers of other uh, philosophers who had inspired me on other occasions. And so we then have a work with um, Emerson, Muir, uh, Mills, and um, and Suzuki. So it really is, um, it becomes this adventure of discovery. Um, we have a CEO, young woman, who is who feels she is doing everything she can for the environment, but something is just not clicking for her. So she comes and visits these four um, people. The actors don't really play, play them as characters, but rather embody their words and their philosophy. And through that um, journey, she comes to realize that she cannot change the outer environment until she has changed that within her. What can you tell us about the development of this unique piece of theater from it, you know, the initial genesis, someone asking you to write something to where we are now? The, um, I, I worked up a draft um, and in the course of that, um, initially there were three philosophers. Uh, Kenneth Mills, Emerson, and um, Walt Whitman. Of course, the advantage of that is that the Emerson and Whitman are in the public domain, mm -hmm. and that makes this kind of project much easier. Um, mm -hmm. In the meantime, I read uh, an interview with um, David Suzuki in the um, um, Literary Review of Canada and thought, wow, I should really see if I can incorporate some of his work into this. So I contacted him through his uh, personal secretary, and turns out he was very enthusiastic about the project oh. and, and gave us uh, his blessing. So that had, excuse me, that incorporated one more philosopher and a living one. Mm -hmm. and in, the, in the meantime, um, I read an article that the uh, uh, work of John Muir had just come into the public domain. So now I have this uh, smorgasbord of uh, yeah. ecological philosophy uh, at my disposal. So what I decided to do was to work with the four authors that I mentioned, Emerson, Muir, Mills, and Suzuki. And then my dear friend, Walt Whitman, uh, brings, us, brings it all together in the end with uh, one of his poems used as the, uh, as the epilogue. Right. Then um, I started um, scripting it as I normally do. I come up with a draft, I invite friendly ears uh, in the form of actors and writers and directors and have a read through. And people were very, very, very helpful. Um, two major suggestions, which were very interesting. And it, initially, uh, Beck, who is the main character, the CEO, does not respond to Suzuki. And when I share this with one of my uh, very successful business lady friends, uh, she said, there's, there's no CEO in Canada who would not uh, give Dr. Suzuki a run for his money. So you, you've got to have her respond um, 
somehow or other to uh, to David Suzuki. So that was extremely helpful, and it and it it helped me uh, develop the character of Beck. Um, and the other uh, suggestion was uh, from a fellow writer here in Windsor. He he felt there should be children or a child in the play, and so I, I incorporated uh, Phoenix, who is in this in this particular production the daughter of Beck. The other idea was I wanted all of the uh, roles to be gender fluid, preferably a cast of three men and three women. Um, this this time around, it is uh, four men, four women and, and two men. Um, but um, I like it to be gender fluid because the you know these are universal ideas. Though the language, of course, in some cases is dated, but I think uh, I think we can accept that um, because they're great great writers. Then we uh, did a workshop in Toronto with a group of young actors. I worked on it a bit more. And then ye old pandemic uh, intervened. And so it's been sitting a while um, in, in readiness. And so um, I decided that I would like to do it uh, in the summertime, do it out of doors in case we had any um, issues with, um, with COVID again. And so I, um, decided I needed someone with whom to co-produce this. So I approached mm -hmm. my dear friends at post-production and posed this uh, joint project with them. And to my delight and, and uh, um, uh, pleasure, they agreed. And so we entered into um, a partnership between the Kenneth Mills Foundation from Toronto and post-productions here in, uh, in Windsor. And the special um, feature is that we're doing it out of doors and we're doing it um, at a very special place in Amherstburg. It is, it is the, the residence of Catherine Roth, who um, has named her property Sanctuary Woods. She has a beautiful, beautiful acreage um, in Amherstburg and she wants to share this with people and she felt what a wonderful way to do it would be to um, have us do the play there. So. I think that covers most of the what you. Yeah, uh, you know, you mentioned one of the um, one of the uh, consequences of of the pandemic putting it on hold for a while was that you decided to hold it outdoors, and I think that turned out to be a, a very fortunate uh, change. Uh, I think I think so, Mike. We'll we'll yeah. know better next weekend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's fair. Um, <laughs> um, you know what. You know, you were stalled by the pandemic, as you said. Did, did anything else happen to the work itself during the pandemic? Did you leave it alone or did, you, did it give you time to step back and reflect on it a bit more and come back to it with with fresh eyes? Um, I actually left it alone. Um, and I think generally speaking, in, in my experience with writing, I've never had that pleasure uh, uh, or privilege because I, I, I think it really it really is that because then when you do pick it up, you are looking at it mm -hmm. for the first time because you you haven't been worrying about producing it or who's going to fit what role and you can read the thing you know uh fresh with fresh eyes so yeah. that was very, that was helpful in that regard yeah i find with my myself like most of the things that i've written if i if i go back and read them you know now uh i i have no memory of writing them and it's as though a stranger has done it which allows me i think to to look at it without that emotional investment that might keep me from seeing its flaws. <laughs> very, very much so. Yeah. Um, you know, you mentioned the thinkers uh, that you selected and, and in some cases why you selected them. Um, I was wondering, you know, I, I was going to ask you about why you chose those four thinkers, you know, in particular, but I think I understand why. But I'm wondering from for the for the purposes of the uh, ecologue, and I've been calling it an ecologue rather than ecolage, because I've been thinking of it as an ecological dialogue, you know? Um, oh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> what, what, what is created by putting these four minds in conversation with each other? What, what, uh, what's the, how does, how does the conversation between the ideas of these four minds help deepen the audience's understanding? Ah, that is one great question, Michael. Um, and I think at this point, I would, would answer with a visual um, correlative. 
And that is exactly that, a collage. Something happens uh, visually when you put one image next to another. And of course, one of the, um, the dangers of doing that with words is um, possibility of clashing, but you would have that in a, in a, a visual collage as well. Um, I have to say that the, the crafting of it, the devising of it, if you will, was to make sure that those, um, how can I put it, that the seams were smooth and mm -hmm. yet still allowed enough juxtaposition to be able to, um, in, in a few moments, see how uh, minds from, you know, different centuries view something either differently or very much the same. Uh, yeah. One of the things that I tried to do was to, we, the, the scenes are grouped thematically um, um, based on the elements. So we, we start with air, water, earth, fire, and so on. And in collecting the material from those thinkers um, along those lines, there's, there's that continuity that, which kind of holds it together. But I find actually one of, one of the uh, delights of, of putting the play on is to actually hear those juxtapositions and mm -hmm. what happens. And I think uh, certainly for, for the actors, it's very, um, it's very challenging because there's a, there's a different kind of continuity from line to line. Right. And I'm, I'm hoping that that will not be too difficult a transition for the audience um, because well, um, you're, you're having to put it together in a different way. You're right. But yeah. Well, that's the benefit of having skilled actors and a skilled director. Absolutely. Particularly <laughs> skilled actors. <laughs> <laughs> So you've situated the the ecologue, um, ecolage in a in the context of our ongoing environmental catastrophe or catastrophes, um, one could differentiate, I'm sure, um, which which lends the you know the proceedings right from the beginning of it of the piece this sort of astrological air of urgency, right? Mm -hmm. Why is it important for you that the audience? Um, experience a great round wonder with the context of environmental apocalypse in mind from beginning to end? Well, I would say certainly from beginning, uh, Michael, um, I would, I, I'm ending with Walt Whitman, who, mm -hmm. you know, uh, over 150 years ago, um, saw this incredible unity that was, that is the globe. And mm -hmm. that perspective, I think, um, wraps things up, excuse, excuse the pun there. But, um, you know, people, um, there was a, a major uh, source when I was working on this. It was a, an article in, in the New York Times Magazine section, and it was, a, I believe it was a 20-year retrospective on how really, how far have we really come with climate control and all these things. And it was, it was not encouraging by any stretch of the imagination. And um, I just felt it was important that... Um, we never lose sight of the immediacy of the issue. But what, what I'm hoping that this play will provide is a more universal and a more um, essential remedy to it. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I can understand that. There's a, there's a, um, I mean, one of the, one of the, uh, without giving anything away, one of the, uh, the key lessons um, in the, in the ecologue is the idea that uh, uh, the approaches we've been taking to climate control or climate change mitigation, however you might want to put it, mm -hmm. um, are in a way held back, uh, not necessarily because of technological limitations or only technological Im limitations, but they're held back because of the mindset uh, in which they're being used, right? Amen. Amen. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, Beck. Um, the CEO, uh, responds to Suzuki's attempts to establish a common foundation of premises, a very simple premises such as that we all require clean air and water and soil to survive, uh, with some familiar, I think, economic and political talking points. But what I found most interesting was that she also um, uses a, uh, uh, a particular sort of uh, talking point that is often found in 
uh, some Christian circles, at least in North America, that the earth is here for us to use as we see fit. And that suggested to me that what we're getting in A Great Round Wonder is not only a conversation uh, and a collage of different philosophical and spiritual points of view, we're also seeing in some sense, some perhaps minor sense, a, a clash between the, the demands of spirituality and the habits of religion. Was that intentional? Am I reading too much into that? Um, I, I, I wouldn't say it was intentional, but I'm very happy that you see that uh, aspect in there, Michael. Okay. Uh, because I think, I mean, I, I'm certainly not, not out to um, uh, badmouth religion. Uh, it, it certainly has a place. Uh, just as the, you know, the good intentions of people who do what they can. I mean, another, you know, another very viable approach to climate change is do what you can in your own backyard. You know, right, right. recycle, um, bike to work, you know, the various things that actually Beck mentions in, in her opening, in her opening remarks. Um, and as far, you know, as far as the church is concerned, I think it's more of a cultural undercurrent that the the earth is is here for our use the question of course is how do we use it mm -hmm. uh, you could ask you could ask a um <clears throat> an indigenous person um you know that same question and they would say of course it was god given but and we were to use it but how do we use it right and the whole idea of giving thanks before taking from it whether it be from the land, from the animals, from the fish, from the waters, you know, all of that sort of thing. So, yeah, yeah, that's a, a nice dimension. An attitude towards how it's used. Yes. Perhaps. Yes. Yes. In a section called the Sulphur Cloud, they're, they're, they're st they start articulating a vision of nature um, that I guess it's meant to be a sort of um, a baseline understanding of nature qua nature before we get to nature's relationship to humanity. And it, it seemed to me <clears throat> to have a lot in common with romantic uh, philosophy and poetry, uh, particularly, you know, the German idealists and, and also, you know, poets like like Whitman, uh, yeah. where, where nature, qua nature, nature prior to or, or you know, divided from humanity um, is uh, has a purity that can be hopefully recovered. Yes, yes. Makes sense? <laughs> uh, yes, I think so. Also, I think hand in hand with that, though, is um, a harmony between man and nature. Yes, right. So between human and nature um, that that works. And and it's it's interesting because most um, most of the of the philosophers in in that section refer to their childhood yes. so not only did they perceive you know they they perceived the environment as unsullied because they were unsullied and mm -hmm. so they they there there was no preconception about you know whether the water was was um uh, infected or whether the you know too many of the trees had been taken down and, and that kind of thing but uh yes yes and that 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 again is the perspective you know yeah and you kind of return to that at the end of the piece right when we when we go back to <clears throat> the importance of uh of that childhood that the way we interact with and the way we understand and view nature from that that childlike perspective that there's something there's something beautiful in there worth recovering and something that can be recovered yes and i i think it's the it's the perspective yeah, that you, yeah, you can return to a, a childlike perspective on nature, having now developed a, a deeper response to what appear as the issues. Right. Not, not just, oh, great, everything's fine, but having as Beck goes through this soul searching in which she genuinely wrestles with uh, with these assets. This was this is one of the great challenges of of writing Beck. And um, I have to say that if, if there's any Barry Brody in the play, it's it's in the uh, character of Beck um, because <clears throat> all of that was was scripted. It was it, I didn't didn't pull her lines from any from any place else. Um, 
And that that is she genuinely goes through this questioning procedure and comes out the other end saying, yeah, we, we, I, you know, we, but I need to change my perspective on this. And, mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, as a result of that, of course, only we can do it together. And that, of course, is the great paradox of, you know, solving any issue. We, it appears to be us doing it, and yet it's, it's not. Right. <laughs> Quite so. In the uh, in the breath of all green things and the ocean flowing through our veins, those two sections, you posit this intimate interconnectivity uh, between all living things, right? Via air and water primarily, mm -hmm. and not just living all living things in the present, but extending back into the past, extending forward into the future as well. Um, <clears throat> Do you think that the, which I, I found those sections, I think maybe those are my, those are the most interesting sections of the, of the ecologue to me too. But what I, what I, what I wondered about um, reading about, reading those sections was whether you saw the environmental catastrophes that we're facing as threatening not only um, that, that unity uh, of, of all, living things and the survival of uh, organisms, individual organisms and the survival as ecologies, as systems, but also the spiritual unity that you're talking about as well. Is, is the spiritual unity that you do, that you address in the, in the ecologue um, as threatened by what's happening to the natural world as the natural unity? Because they seem to be quite of a piece as well. I'm not uh, sure that was coherent. No, it was, Michael. And again, <laughs> uh, an, an amazing uh, question. And I would have to say that the simple answer is yes, because they're inextricably uh, interwoven one with the other. Um, and you, and you, what, what, what has amazed me in in the actual performance of this work and and being in the play um, is how. Uh, each each of the philosophers, somehow or other, in his own language, expresses that, mm -hmm. and it uh, which kind of warms my heart because that's one of the things I wanted to do initially was to showcase Kenneth Mill's work in in a collage in a, uh, uh, a collaboration with other uh, poets and thinkers across time. Yeah. And, were you surprised I, by that? Were you pardon? surprised to find that all of them expressed in some way uh, that unity? Uh, not really, because okay. uh, y you know, be between you and me as as writers, um, uh, there is an intuition that draws us to certain things, and I'm thoroughly convinced that these four and 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 Whitman uh, to a degree, um, I was drawn to them because of some innate unity. Um, mm -hmm four of them. Mm -hmm. so I, I'm more might, delighted than surprised. You might not have been uh, uh, entirely conscious of that drawing you to them, but you're not surprised by it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> another thing that I found really fascinating was that the thinkers in, in Great Round Great, Great Round Wonder um, express our, our, our posit in, an intentionality to natural forces uh, like wind. There's a point where one of them says that the you know, the wind plucks a, a leaf or downs a branch when it's necessary to do so. And that intentionality I found quite fascinating. Was that um, intentional? And, and if so, could you expand on that a little more? Um, I would say no, it was not intentional. But mm. once again, Kind of the the fragrance of of the coming together of the four of them um, and seeing seeing I guess seeing it um, focused because you have you know a fair amount of material from all from all of the writers <clears throat> but we're taking something like air and seeing how <clears throat> Muir from his vast um, expansive of uh, exploration certainly in in western us um would would focus in such a way that he would make a remark like that so that 
he was he was perceiving that mm -hmm. in a different way you have emerson per perceiving a, a similar thing and suzuki and, and mills as well but each each in his own um in his own manner or in his own keyship so to speak i like that you describe the combination of them as a fragrance <laughs> I like that as well. I, I I I wouldn't have thought of that. I really enjoy that. You know the other the other thing that this intentionality um, um, reminded me of was a lot of the the deep ecology that was articulated in the primarily last three decades of the twentieth century. And in particular, it made me think of uh, James Lovelock's Gaia hypothesis. Mm -hmm. Did you did you think of that at all as you were working on this piece? Um, it it didn't it it you know it didn't um, it didn't pass the scanning. What can I say? You know, I mean, I was aware of it, but it didn't um, it didn't get captured in the uh, the scanning. But I think you know, I, I mean, frankly, Michael, I think <clears throat> I could write another play with four entirely different thinkers. Oh sure. You know, and come up with something else. Uh, I think the reason that th 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 these four is because these four resonate with me. Oh, sure. Yeah. And you know. I, I was just thinking that as well that, um, you know, of course, you, you're choosing from amongst a host of people you could have chosen instead. Yeah. Right. But one of the things that these four have in common um, that I can see is that they all write beautifully. Right. Yes. And, and I think um, I don't think anyone's going, going to accuse Lovelock of that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that's my uh, take. <laughs> uh, and I'm glad you, you mentioned that particular feature, Michael, because I think that that's also a really important part of what you've you've asked about how what do people expect? How will they come out of this experience? The um, there is no doubt that the language is very rich. It's very poetic. Um, and I sometimes describe it as, you know, cheesecake. Very, very, very rich. But I think it's important because uh, people today um, don't are not exposed in the regular order of things, are not exposed to good language, much, much less heightened language. And so, you know, if they come in contact with this language and, and sit with it for an hour or so, uh, that will change their own frequency. I, mm -hmm. I really feel very strongly that uh, just being around it and hearing it and imbibing it will will change them. You know, tragically, I think it's uh, it's it's very much the case now that you can graduate from a university, even from a humanities program, without being exposed to a lot of what is most beautiful in the language and the culture, uh, which seems to me uh, just baffling. <laughs> I agree. I agree. It's it's funny because the other the other thing we were when we were you know pulling the the program together, I thought. Gee, um, I'd better put bios about these four philosophers because I'll bet you that if you if any any average audience member might know David Suzuki, mm -hmm. but I would be uh, hard pressed to have them know who any of the others were. Yeah, and they might know David Suzuki from his TV appearances and so forth, but they probably won't have read his books. And you know, as is quite clear in uh, A Great Round Wonder, um, he's a beautiful writer. Oh, is he ever? Yeah. He ever. Yeah. He can hold his own with these others. Yeah, <laughs> very much so. And, you know, as someone who hadn't read, I'd read some articles by him, but I hadn't read any, any of his books. I was surprised by how well his writing stood up uh, alongside these three others. Yes, yes. I um, was delightfully surprised. The The... Um, Sacred Balance, which is the book that um, uh, most, the majority of, of the Suzuki material is taken from, uh, there are passages, Michael, that are extremely technical. And mm -hmm. he gets into a lot of science, he gets into a lot of ar um, archaeology, geology, and, and biology, and all those things. But nonetheless, there is this overriding um, a poetic uh, charge, charge to it. That, mm -hmm. uh, he, in the book, he quotes Gerard Manley Hopkins. He quotes Shakespeare. Um, he's obviously very well versed in uh, in the poetics of uh, ecology. Well, in that way, he's an old school scientist. You know, the scientists, you know, 150, 200 years ago were often 
beautiful writers themselves. I mean, Darwin's The Descent of Man is, is a gorgeously written book. It is. Uh, and that, you know, and even that's not even taught anymore, which is too bad because it's still quite relevant. Anyway, <laughs> so in Dialogue 2, uh, Mills brings up his notion of the absolute, which is uh, similar in many ways to to some conceptions of gods. And it's very pagan, right, in that it's it's almost indistinguishable from, from nature itself. I think it's meant to be indistinguishable from nature itself. <clears throat> uh, what more can you tell us about, about that notion of the absolute? Because it seems to be very important to understanding the piece as a whole. It, what can you tell us about the role it plays? Well, uh, th there are many names uh, for for that which governs um, our lives, uh, the order of the universe, etc. Um, Mary Baker Eddy, uh, Mary Baker Eddy, the founder of Christian Science, um, offered seven definitions or different words for God. Uh, one of which was principle. And the wonderful thing, at least I find, about shifting that is that you don't. The mind doesn't bring with it all the baggage. If I said to you you know, um, do you believe in God? There would be, you know, a whole raft of things that come into that idea or that word God. Whereas I say, do you believe in the absolute or do you believe in principle or in love uh, or spirit? It frees, it frees up a lot of mental baggage for those things. And I think particularly uh, when we're talking about, you know, an ordered universe, that something like principle will ring truer in the hearts and minds of people than say something like God. And right. so it does, um, I, I don't know if pagan is necessarily th the word that I would use, but universal, mm -hmm. you know, something that, um, how shall I put it, be accepted across um, regions of, of religion and philosophy and so on. I mean, as, as we you know saw earlier, people who are entrenched in religion will be entrenched in religion. But I think those like Beck who are really wanting to see things differently will be open to a new language. Mm -hmm. a new mm -hmm. perspective. And so philosophically, I think you, you you've expressed several several reasons to use a term like the absolute and, and explained what's what's meant by it. But there's just strategic reason too right which is that you um you would like the audience to be open to what comes next right and and as you say if we, you use another term the connotations the baggage that comes with it um might prevent people from being receptive yeah yeah I would yeah. Agree. yeah yeah well it's a sensible strategy i think uh-huh i hadn't thought about it as a strategy but you know <laughs> Why we're having this conversation, Michael? I'm, I'm <laughs> loving it. This is great. This is great. Thank you for being. I'm, I must interject here. Thank you for um, having such astute um, responses to the uh, to the script. Oh well, I mean, thank you for writing something that that makes me ask questions. You know, it's it's not always the case, <laughs> right? Oh. Uh, some things there's there's nothing there's nothing in there to 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 wonder about, right? To oh. question. And so I'm always appreciative if something makes me uh, makes me curious, makes me ask questions, making me makes me sit back and think for a while. And I love the experience of not immediately understanding something. I think that's a really important experience to have in one's daily life. Absolutely, Michael. You are blessed. Yeah. You are blessed to have that. <laughs> Absolutely. Let's hope, let's hope other audience members share that. I hope so. So in the divine fire. Um, the thinkers talk about the double-edged sword of energy, in particular, our use of energy, right? And uh, I was surprised that, as the discussion progressed, that the um, the potential that alternative sources of energy have, like solar and wind, to also be double-edged swords wasn't addressed. Uh, because it seems to me that, given what's said in the ecologue and, and given human experience to date, we have good reason to expect that renewable sources of energy will also prove to be double-edged swords. What do you think of that? Um, you raise a good point. I um, I hadn't thought about that. Um, I guess you're right. I mean, electricity 
Right. Anything. Right. You know, to me, the ultimate, and, and, and this is where I come down with it, is that is this, the, I think uh, uh, Suzuki has it, the idea fire was the first technology that we dealt with. And, and there you've got it. I mean, and it's clear today as it was in centuries past, double-edged sword. It can heat your home. It can burn down your home. And we see that, you know, vividly over the past few years with these incredible forest fires all over the globe. Um, I guess, you know, I certainly didn't intend to um, differentiate one from the other. S some are easier to, and, and even I think Beck says, you know, that there is a place for oil in, mm -hmm. in, in the scheme of things. And it's not, it's not a, an either or situation, it's an and, but it's in each case, how do we use it? Right, right. How do we use fire? How do we use oil? How do we use um, wind and uh, right. and all that um, kind of thing? And, and the extent to which, right? In terms of oil, for instance, I don't think even the most huh, skeptical or the most um, resistant CEO of an oil company must admit that we overuse oil. Yes. Right? You'd think? Yeah. I, you know, I was reminded, I recently we have, a war, read, we have a war going on in Europe over that. Right, right, exactly. I was, recently I read the play Copenhagen, uh, oh. which is about um, Niels Bohr's mystery visit from, oh gosh, what was his name? Um, Eisenberg, from Heisenberg. 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 Yeah, he was working in Germany. And um, during the war, you know, and Heisenberg was not a Nazi, but working for the Nazis, but he got special permission to go and visit Niels Bohr. And, you know, these are two of the, the fathers of, uh, of quantum theory and, and nuclear, um, nuclear science, right? Atomic science. And, um, and, and the play explores, you know, the conceit of the play is what happened at this mystery meeting that is documented, um, but no one knows, you know, what they talked about. But, uh, the, the the real heart of the play, though, is is a discussion about these advances and what they're opening up, but also their dangers. What I found interesting in that in that play was that there is a lot of discussion about the dangers, the potential dangers, because at this point they're only theoretical, that uh, atomic weapons presented, nuclear weapons. But not once do they discuss possible dangers of nuclear reactors for energy mm. right so so they they were coming at the idea of nuclear power um, as uh, w with a with a certain blindness to the potential drawbacks which can be pretty dramatic and I wonder sometimes whether we just haven't seen the other edge of the sword yet when it comes to solar and wind it's hard for me to imagine that they pose much danger but uh, that may be a limit of my own imagination, you know? Uh, yes, I think, again, you raise a, a great point. Um, part of it, I think, is the enthusiasm of something new. Mm -hmm. so, you know, especially like when you fall in love with someone, you, you, you don't want to know the bad side, um, and, but you get to know them better and love them deeper and, and you discover the multifaceted. I think the same thing with any technology or any discovery Mm. There is, uh, as you as you get to know it, as you get to use it, you begin to realize. And that's where, to me, that's where the great um, uh, responsibility of the human race is, that's what's given, if it says in the Bible that it's been given to you to, to use, that's been given to us to dispense, to, to use, to manipulate for the benefit of mankind, right. not um, right. misuse it or overuse it just because we have it. Right. It's, it's not permission to be reckless. Exactly. Exactly. Right? If, I think, if I let my neighbor use my lawnmower, I'm going to object if he smashes it to pieces in the street. <laughs> of course. Of course. <laughs> or uses it as a weapon to attack my other neighbor. <laughs> That's right. But if he's using it to, to mow both of your lawns so that they look like one continuous lawn, then it fulfills right. purpose, right? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, I like that analogy. So in the arms of love, uh, your thinkers adopt what seems to me a really interesting form of materialism, a sort of pragmatist variety of materialism in which matter is all there is. However, um, 
it, it isn't always observable to us until it's used, right? Until it until there's action. And I found that very, very interesting. And uh, I wanted to, to know more about uh, about this conception of uh, of the world of of parts of reality being invisible until they're used, until they're acted upon or until they act. Mm, wow. Yeah, I, I always like to be aware of that, too. And I think we have. <clears throat> I think the, the closest, most immediate example we have, uh, Michael, is our, our own imagination. Mm -hmm. Because on the one hand, it's not material, but when we put it into action, when we choose as as artists, as creatives, when we choose to bring something into um, into this dimension, we're doing that. We're taking right. the idea as I think it's in the the lines of uh, Kenneth Mills. It's um, bringing an idea into a corresponding identity, so that right. you you take the idea of um, comfort. And then you bring that into uh, reality as a chair, or as right. a sofa, or as a chaise lounge. Right. So yeah, that, it's a very pragmatist orientation, which you know I find really interesting. Uh, you know, the idea, for instance, that uh, whether or not someone has the potential to do something um, is it's an open question. The potential doesn't exist until the person acts. And then we'll know whether or not they have the potential. But until that point, it's just a possibility. It doesn't really exist except as a, a possibility in the world, right? And uh, James famously said, um, thoughts are incomplete until discharged in action. You know, for wow. him, thoughts weren't, weren't, you know, real in the sense that people often mean the word real until we do something with them. Yeah. And it, it reminded me a lot of that. Uh, the visual that comes to me, Michael, is that scene in uh, I think it's Raiders of the Lost Ark, where um, and I think it's it's Harrison Ford who sees the um, uh, the Grail, the Ark, whatever it is he's after across this chasm. Yes. And he it isn't until he steps out that the um, the bridge is there and and yeah. basically catches him and carries him across. I've always I've always found that as an incredible image for for any act of creativity. You know, you have to you have to kind of do it um, to ignite um, the result. Right, right. You know, I was funny. I was just thinking of that scene this morning, and I don't wow. know if it's because I was thinking about Great Round Wonder this morning. Probably that's why. But I was thinking of that exact scene. <laughs> amazing, amazing. It's, you know, it's also the idea. You know, when it comes to um, and pragmatism uh, as, as it applies to morality that um, you know you don't have a virtue um, as a characteristic of yourself apart from what you do right so whether or not you are um, respectful um, is a is determined by how you act how you treat other people and you can't say I'm respectful while acting disrespectfully uh, without without being incoherent, right? That there's no virtues and vices ex don't exist apart from our choices and actions either. As a very wise man once said, beauty is as beauty does. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We're bringing all sorts of references and thinkers into this. <laughs> I want to go back to the absolute. Um, my my background, by the way, is in, is, is in both philosophy and religious studies. So there are aspects of this that um, led me to, to reflect on things that I hadn't reflected on in a while, which was nice. Um, so regarding the absolute, uh, is it possible to, or is it is it necessary that we relate to the absolute, that our relationship to the absolute is one of worship? Is it possible, for instance, to have a relationship to the absolute that um, involves more dignity? Because worship, of course, involves subservience. Well, um, I'd have to say I don't. I don't think worship necessarily has to involve subservience. Um, okay. The um, but um, 
the relationship yeah, to the absolute, I think, is relations. Be, Sorry? Be, I think the, our, our relationship to the absolute is, um, is multidimensional. Okay. And, um, in, in the sense, um, if one views uh, the absolute as the, the source of, of creativity, uh, the self, what, again, whatever these terms are, they are <clears throat> closer than the nose on our face, as they say, because mm. it, what, it's what we are in, in, in essence. Um, but the ecologue know, though seems to the ecologue seems to promote a relationship to the absolute that is defined by worship, or did I misread it? Well, um, there th that language is used uh, for okay. sure, um, and I think that, that. But I think I don't know, Michael. You, you've caused me to consider um, whether worshiping is something subservient. I I, I guess. I don't know. I can I can worship someone I love and not necessarily feel subservient, although I would do anything for them. Um, I, I guess that's what that's what I'm twigging on is the subservience. I don't I don't see um, that as necessarily an element of worship. Certainly it is. I mean, people I think who who worship blindly or who worship um, um, you know. Um, unconsciously um, could, could be subservient. To me, it, it seems worship always involves um, <clears throat> a serious power difference in that we, you know, worship is directed towards something that um, is, is or is believed to be um, more powerful than ourselves. Uh. And that can be a power that is forced upon us, but it can also be a power we grant. Right. True. True. So, yeah, I, you know, I was thinking when I was reading that, um, what occurred to me was that to me, uh, worship wouldn't be the attitude I would want to take, but certainly awe would be. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't think there's enough awe in the world right now. I agree with you 100 percent. Yeah. I think maybe we could. We could find a joining word, which would be wonder. Wonder, uh, yeah, yeah. I, wonder and awe. I think these are these are fundamentally transformative emotional experiences that we often in our present society get very little opportunity to um, experience. And in fact, I think much of our present society is organized in such a way that we forget that awe and wonder are even possible, and we're kept so busy and preoccupied that we couldn't experience these things even if we were in a situation to do so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Kenneth, yeah, Kenneth Mills once said, um, a world without wonder is a world without miracle. Right, yeah, yeah. I think the greatest thing you can do is keep yourself open to wonder. That's why, you know, the child is, and I'm so grateful to uh, to my colleague who suggested putting a child in the play because the child comes in with that childlike wonder, mm -hmm. you know, of discovering um, the, the beauty of a leaf or the beauty of a of a frog, you know, something yeah. that, that uh, seems so ordinary to the adult mind because, you know, we've, we're jaded, but um, is, is always a wonder, you know, the fact that the the leaves can be stirred by the wind. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah. You know, one of, I think the, for me anyway, one of the, uh, one of the most bittersweet experiences I have on a regular basis is watching people grow up and watching, therefore, that wonder vanish. Oh, uh, Michael. Right? Oh. Uh. It's tragic, but it's it's almost universal. However, I think that it can be recovered with effort. Oh, I know it can. I agree. Yeah. 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 And hopefully, <laughs> hopefully, a play like A Great Round Wonder will do that. I should hope so. It's in the title. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and that's kind of why I was thinking about awe, because what what is described um, 
um, throughout the play, the, the, the picture that you're gradually building, it reminded me of a, of a painting, right, where you dab colors here and there, and for a while you're not sure if anything is really being painted, but then it takes, the, the, the picture emerges from the dabs of color. Um, yeah, and, and what you've what you've created with this uh, with this word painting is um, is is something that um, reminds us uh, of not only perhaps the possibility of awe, but the necessity of awe if we understand the world and our places in it. Amen, brother. Amen. All right, we're on yeah. the same page. <laughs> yeah, very much so. And 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 I would hope then that people would come away from the performance having, as you put it, put together their own picture from how they assembled the daubs of color and yeah. the pieces of collage to create. You know, it it, it kind of reminds me of, uh, there. there is an art, uh, many artists do this, but there's one artist that I've met recently who who takes little images of, say he's doing a portrait of, uh, Napoleon. He will take little images of Napoleon, uh, Napole scenes from Napoleon's life, friends of Napoleon, and so on, and he will put them into uh, mosaic-like uh, um, collage so that when you step back from the painting, you see a portrait of Napoleon. But when you go up to it, you see all these details from Napoleon's life. Oh and uh, perhaps maybe that's um, a, a way of, of experiencing a great round wonder. Because once I you, yeah, I love that idea. Yeah, you should. Love uh, I wish if I weren't blind, I'd really love to see this. <laughs> <laughs> ah, I wish I'd seen it when I wasn't. That sounds really interesting. It sounds incredibly difficult, but worth the effort. It's very laborious uh, for, for mm -hmm. the art. Very time consuming, I should say. Oh he, he's not laborious. He 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 loves doing it. But it's uh, it uh, yeah it. Um, but thank you for. Um, for giving that visual um, image of, of the play, because, you know, as I say, it started it started out with this visual image more than anything else, you know, which is why I kind of call it a dramatic ecolage rather than a play. You know? Right. There, there is a beginning, middle and end. Um, you know, Beck, Beck is transformed, I, I believe. And um, and I'm hoping since I want the audience to identify mostly with Beck, that she will bring people with her through her um, um, epiphany, if you will, or her her conversion experience or her transformation, um, and that that uh, she's the you know the main character in that regard. Yeah, I, a couple other things before I let you go because I know this is going on a long time. Um, Been great fun, Michael. The law of love. Can you explain the law of love to me a little more? Oh, Lord. I want to make sure I understand it. Um, right? I think the, the, the law of love yeah. is that which uh, holds us together. So that's the spiritual unity. Yes. Yes. And if you have that, you know, everything else follows from that. I think the law of love is, is um, wrapped up in the paradox that uh, we each appear to be individuals. And yet we are all one, mm -hmm. and that love transcends um, any differences. Right, right. <clears throat> and so, yes, yeah, it's, it's it functions in the same way then as as the uh, as the air and the water do, linking all of the uh, living organisms physically. Yes, that is right. that is why I included it. the the um, The scenes in the play start out with the. Um, um, the four elements, um, mm -hmm. air, water, earth, fire. And so I uh, wanted to have what I considered the fifth element with love. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Or spirit. Some would call it spirit. Yeah. But I don't know if that's. Yeah. yeah. Mary Baker Eddy. Mary Baker Eddy calls it a synonym of God. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, similar to that. Um, I was sort of intrigued by this this idea that um, uh, what was it that that how did it go 
that in order to transform, we needed elegance, grace, and simplicity, or we needed to apprehend the elegance, grace, and simplicity of the world? Is that how it went? Uh, yes, those are the, the, the line goes, um, but the question to ask is, does my outer environment express the all-inclusive nature of elegance, grace, and grace. simplicity? Right. Yeah, and I understood what was meant there in terms of elegance and grace, given everything that came before. But I have to admit, I was surprised by simplicity uh, because to that point, it seemed that what was being expressed was uh, an almost an almost incomprehensible level of complexity. But that led me to believe I don't understand what he means by simplicity. He's using simplicity in a way that I that I'm not accustomed to. Uh, so can you explain well what yeah. he means? That could very well be. I, I, I can't necessarily speak uh, for what he means by it, um, but I do know that uh, in my experience with working with Kenneth Mills, words would always words were um, primarily a frequency. Mm. Uh, and it was there were often times when we would um, in working with him as actors presenting his material um, approach it in a more musical way than say in a linear verbal way. Right, right. And I think simplicity. I must I must say um, in 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 comp devising that and using that excerpt and then now having to say it on stage or on on ground. Um, that it it surprises me too, Michael. It yeah, and, I, too. and I've heard, I've come across you know different conceptions of simplicity. So my my uh, my thought at that point wasn't what wasn't you know Mills doesn't know what he's saying. It was there is something being expressed here that I'm not accustomed to. Yeah, and uh, maybe it'll just take some maybe maybe it will just take some some more reflection to get it too. We'll see. I think so. I mean, any you know that that should be the case with any good performance of any good play. Yes, it, it doesn't leave you where it finds you, and you you walk out of the theater um, wondering. Yeah, yeah, so, absolutely. You know, absolutely. Yeah, if if somebody walks out of the theater and and wonders, well, what what simplicity have to do with elegance and uh, and grace? Um, good for them. <laughs> yes. You know? Yes. I like that attitude. <laughs> well, I'll have one question for you, and I don't know if this is completely off base. So if it is, you just let me know and we can ignore it. But to me, it seemed that there was an economic argument bubbling under the surface of a great round wonder here and there um, that was never explicitly um, set out or articulated. And it has to do with, um, the way that uh, um, our economic, our economic ideology, right, capitalism, ties us to uh, those those vices that ties us to the ignorance, the spiritual ignorance that Mills talks about, which ties us to the vices of greed and apathy and selfishness, and that uh, given the given the uh, the power of that economic ideology on individual human lives and on ecosystems and so forth. I was wondering if we needed to, if in order to change our outer and inner environments in the way that the ecolog um, uh, pushes us towards, I think rightfully so, uh, do we then also need to change our economic ideology? Is it possible for those kinds of changes to happen while retaining the dominant econ econ uh, economic ideology of our times. Wow. Um, I don't know, but I would imagine that, I mean, any any time that I've had a um, life-changing um, or, or paradigm shift in my perspective on something essential, a lot of other things follow along the line. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I'm trying to think of an example, but I think you, uh, um, you know, once you decide, um, I don't know, um, once you decide to do something, then um, other things fall in its train. I'm trying to think of, of an example. Um, well, be beliefs, beliefs, right, are, are part of, oh, yeah. are part yeah. of systems, right? They're, and they're connected to other beliefs. 
um, with all sorts of different threads of varying strengths, right? So removing a belief is going to, to take other beliefs with it. It certainly will. Uh, what, necessarily. I'll, I'll toss this out there, but it, and it, 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 for what it is, if you choose to stop smoking, you, you open yourself up to saving money, saving time, um, having more uh, connection time with your family and friends, and a whole a whole world opens up to you just because you've decided to stop smoking. And and by no means do I um, offer that as a trivial, uh, insignificant decision because it's major mm -hmm. and it changes your life. Sure. Yeah. You know, yeah. So changing your perspective on how you view the world will naturally. You know, the next time you go to the grocery store and look at a plastic bag, it's going to it's going to change you, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it reminds me of something that we often run into, and it's part of a lot of what I teach um, in my courses, you know, that I'm teaching people um, how to teach effectively, how to how to uh, engender learning. <laughs> let's say. Ah, and uh, nice. and uh, so what that what that is in a very very simplified sense is that you are trying at minimum trying to sell beliefs you have beliefs to sell and you want the students to buy them and you want them to 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 not only buy them and 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 be able to remember them when it comes time for an assessment but you want them to become part of how they see the world how they understand existence and so forth um, but the biggest obstacle to, to learning a new idea or a new belief or uh, a new theory, whatever it might be, um, are the other things we believe. So meaningful learning often can only happen after a process of unlearning. And a lot of frustration um, is experienced by teachers when they don't know that, when they don't recognize that, that all this effort you're putting into helping students learn something is a waste of time until you find out which false beliefs or which which outdated ideas and so forth they already have and then create situations in which you can bring about the unlearning of those and uh that's what your your piece made me think of well thank you i uh i hope uh, i hope that it will it will you know at the very least jostle some beliefs I think jostling is always a, a wonderful end in itself. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I, you know, you've already said too, and I, I think it's a wonderful thing that what you hope people come away from a great round wonder with is, is uh, <clears throat> you know, their own constellation of colors, their own paintings, right in their heads, their own way of making meaning from what they've just experienced, and uh, uh, there will be a beautiful multiplicity of meanings coming out of this. Yes, I hope yeah. so. I hope so too. Well, thank you very much, Barry. This has been thank you, very interesting. And uh, I really appreciate that you took all this time to sit and chat with me because it it's was a lot. Fun. It's been fun. <laughs> and thank you for such a uh, diligent and, uh, and thoughtful read of the script. I can't oh. wait for you to uh, experience it. I am I'm, I'm looking forward to it too. I mean, I was I'm always just happy when uh, when when someone gives me something to read that actually um, makes me think and uh, and doesn't just vanish from my mind the second I put it down. Ah. <laughs> you know? You're here. That's a yeah, that's a wonderful thing in itself. Well, thank you very much, Barry, and uh, we'll see you soon. Okay, bye bye.